To prove why I believe citizenship today is such a bargain and worth adding to your portfolio, if nothing else is an insurance policy, I'm going to take you on a walk down memory lane past the $11,000 citizenship option that was and other options that you missed out on over the years. So my theory is, if you look at, for example, Caribbean citizenship by investment, St. Lucia, Dominica, single applicant, $100,000. Other programs, $130,000, $150,000 and up for a family. This is a bargain, considering that in many cases in the Caribbean, uh, and under certain conditions in Turkey and other programs, you don't even have to go to the country to apply for, get your citizenship, or live there afterwards. This is a great way to get a backup passport. Uh, in your portfolio to ensure against who knows what could happen in the future, expand on your visa-free travel, open up more business opportunities. And yet people think, oh, well, that's a lot of money. Imagine what the price is going to be in five or 10 years when you see a lot more demand from emerging countries. We're seeing a lot more demand from Americans who are realizing that their country is heading in the wrong direction. And just to show that prices today are a bargain, I'm going to walk you through some prices back from the 80s and 90s and 2000s of programs that you've never heard of. If it's your first time here, my name is Andrew Henderson, the founder of Nomad Capitalist. We're a boutique consultancy that helps seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally reduce their taxes, diversify and protect their assets, and yes, increase their freedom and options with things like second passports. I'm also the host of the biggest and best offshore conference called Nomad Capitalist Live, open to all. And our friends at My Daily uh, put together a history of citizenship by investment. I'm going to walk you through this because we've seen 40 years essentially of programs where you can go and contribute to a country's economy directly and directly get citizenship in return. That means that you're a dual citizen. That means that you have the ability to live in both countries, or if it's a European country, the entire European Union, all of Europe. And so uh, the idea that, you know, hey, $100,000 donation for, for citizenship in a Caribbean country plus all the costs is high. I believe it will be higher. And so let's just go through 1982 the very first modern citizenship by investment program in the modern age was in Tonga. Initially, they had sold what was called a Tongan Protected Person Passport. It was the T Triple P. The king of Tonga then moved that about a year later to full-fledged passports. And one of the initial customers of that was the ousted Philippine dictator, uh, Ferdinand Marcos and his entire family. They became Tongan citizens, it is known. And so the idea was that you made basically a, a donation to the king. There were different prices, of over, I recall correctly, but the numbers back then were like in the thousands, low tens of thousands of dollars. And Tonga's citizenship is not quite as good as a Caribbean citizenship today, um, but they were part of a raft of countries that in the 2010s got visa-free travel to Europe. Um, they've always had, you know, visa-free travel certainly within the region there in the, in the Pacific, um, you know, and there's been, you know, certainly some optionality available. I mean, if you think that, like, the country of Tonga is going to chase you down to the edges of the earth to, like, collect money from you or impose a regulation, uh, not likely to happen. So then uh, in 1994, shortly after Tonga uh, had this program, St. Kitts and Nevis, which has been running ever since, opened up their program. The next year, Belize, a country that we've talked about before, still has a residence program, still has tax incentives, but Belize opened their economic citizenship program, and it was $40,000. It remains the cheapest Caribbean passport that's ever been offered. They are a member of CARICOM, as are the five Caribbean countries that currently offer citizenship. And while Belize does not offer visa-free travel still to, uh, to the Schengen area in Europe, we did help somebody get a Belizean passport once through Ancestry, and it still is available that way. Uh, but for 40000 uh, bucks, this was a great opportunity to travel to the UK, to travel to Ireland. You've got great travel in that region. And so in terms of tax-friendly places, in terms of English-speaking places, in terms of attractive destinations, um, a Belize passport was actually pretty good. And you can, there's a lot of perks that come with that. It's only 40000 bucks. They eventually canceled it right after 9-11 uh, after as the, uh, the U.S. government kind of pushed on them, perhaps a... Uh, a taste of things to come. Now, in 1987, another country uh, that actually ha has a compact with the United States, the Marshall Islands, opened up a citizenship by investment program. And this is the program where I believe uh, the U.S., because Marshall Islanders have certain privileges in the U.S., uh, the U.S. made clear that those privileges would only extend to people who were, who were born in or married to, as I recall, uh, native Marshall Islanders, that if you got citizenship through the donation, uh, that that wouldn't work. This was actually pretty expensive back in the day. 1987, $100,000. Um, and so what happened, though, eventually was that they found out citizenship was actually being sold for, for far, far less. 
And so obviously we encourage everyone to do things legally. There are a number of like in the Caribbean discounting programs, which are either flat out illegal or I believe risky. We don't you know, involve our clients in those. We, we counsel them against those. You might see some of those in Dubai where people are like doing some kind of shady tactics to reduce the price. Um, and I think there could be some risks in doing that. But back then in the Marshall Islands, I don't think that you like lost your citizenship just because you got in on some lower price. That was an expensive one for back then. But it did come with you know this kind of this privilege of like travel to I think even Canada, the U.S. as I said didn't allow that. But you could go to a lot of places as a Marshall Island citizen, and that program is is gone. It's gone, uh, long gone. Now in 1988, people don't know this. Ireland had an economic citizenship program that lasted for about 10 years, and they offered about 150 passports for a million euro, uh, sorry, a million pound back then. Uh, investment in the country for the promotion of, of job creation and job maintenance. Basically, not dissimilar to what you get in the United States today for EB-5. Now, Ireland was certainly a different country back in 1988. Um, the Celtic Tiger certainly really revolutionized the country. Uh, but imagine what you'd have now if you had just made an investment in creating some jobs there. Uh, you'd have a European Union passport. You'd have post-Brexit the ability to go to London. Uh, and that was available for basically investing in, in the country. I think you see similar programs now where you hire some people, you get residents. Um, you hire people in Turkey, or you buy real estate in Turkey, you get citizenship. You buy real estate in St. Kitts and Nevis, you get citizenship. There are other programs uh, in Europe today where you could probably invest a similar amount or somewhat more and get citizenship if you're a person who's a high-level business person. Um, Austria has a program. But look, I mean, Austria now is a 3 million euro investment, and it doesn't come with as much optionality uh, as Ireland. Uh, 1991, Samoa opened a, a program with prices as low as $11,000 for citizenship. Now, Samoa, kind of like Tonga, passport wasn't as good back then. Now it's not a terrible passport. It's actually a halfway decent passport, another one of the countries that now can visit uh, Europe um, since the 2010s. But what they called this was a highly irregular scheme that had all kinds of like different unofficial sales of citizenships, passports, even diplomatic passports, something I generally caution against. You're not getting a diplomatic passport unless you're going to be a diplomat. Uh, but they sold about 2,200 passports over a six-year period for varied prices, but averaging about 11,000 bucks. Imagine for 11,000 bucks back in 1991, getting this obscure country of Samoa, being their citizen, having a place. I mean, you want to talk about living far away from it all. You want a place to go to escape whatever happens in the world? Um, maybe other than, than uh, rising sea levels, but Samoa would be a place to do that. Now, another program we've talked about that only lasted about a, a year uh, due to um, complaints from the local population, and I think they issued about 12 passports, was Peru. Um, most of the folks, Hong Kong is always the place where these people have historically gone to sell passports, and there's been some, some legit deals, and there's been some shady deals there, but $25,000, you could have become Peruvian. Now, being in South America, you're still away from it all, not as far as in the Pacific, but you have some dry land to hold on to. Uh, you have privileges traveling throughout South America. Peru is actually a country now that's one of the most difficult countries, in my opinion, in Latin America to get residents in because the stated goalposts aren't really upheld. Uh, and so it's a good passport to have. Um, you can now travel to Europe. Again, back in 1992, it wasn't as good. Most passports weren't as good in 1992. Um, the U.S. passport wasn't as good as it is now in 1992. But they had this kind of strict streeting process. It was ahead of its time. And they changed their constitution. 25000 bucks. You'd have a passport that now, I would argue, has a lot more optionality than the Caribbean passport for a lot lower price. Gone in 1993, which is when the Dominica program opened. It's been here ever since. Uh, in 1996, Grenada opened a program, later closed it again after 9-11. You now know that Grenada's program is back. Cambodia also opened a program in 1996. Now, why Cambodia, you say? Well, because Asian countries, generally speaking, outside of Malaysia, South Korea, and Taiwan, uh, and parts of Japan, Japan, don't allow you to own land. And so if you want to own land, you need to be a citizen. And so the king set up a program with a donation, $250,000. Imagine if you were buying land in Cambodia in 1996. I've been a big advocate for Cambodia for almost a decade now. And I think you would have done very well for yourself. They recently closed that program, the donation option. You can still invest in an active business in Cambodia and get citizenship. And if you wanted to live in Asia, by the way, uh, as long as people would take you seriously with that passport, then um, it would give you certain optionality in the Asian region. Uh, Tonga had a passport program. Again, you might think, why would I want to be Samoan or, or Tonga? So they closed their program in... Uh, in 1996. 
um, but it kind of continued on after that. Why do these countries like Tonga, Samoa, why are they interesting? Because they give you flexibility. If you're a U.S. citizen, if you're a German citizen, if you're an Australian citizen, your country probably has um, a lot of regulations, a lot of taxes, um, and, and to where if you don't want to be part of that, you know, having the ability to get away from that to me is beneficial. Tonga is not going to follow you around. Uh, Nauru, this is the one that has like the, the phosphate mining. Um, and Australians object to this, but back in 1998, they offered 15 to $50,000. Again, this kind of, this South Pacific has always had this weird system to where like Vanuatu does now, there's like different programs and there's always been this kind of weirdness around them. But 15, as little as $15,000, you can get economic citizenship in Nauru. Again, a passport that um, has become much better since then, uh, but is now a halfway decent passport to have. Uh, I don't know if you would actually live there. I think the place is pretty uh, depressing, but you could certainly live in that region. And so that went away. Uh, Ireland's program then went away. Grenada's program went away. Belize's program then went away. Nauru's program then went away. Uh, the Comoros opened a program, uh, my beloved Comoros in 2001, uh, selling passports at uh, some of the lowest prices we've seen in this industry. Then um, Cyprus and Malta and Antigua and Vanuatu and St. Lucia and Turkey and Jordan and Egypt and Moldova came along, Montenegro came along, North Macedonia came along, but doesn't actually, citizen, actually issue any citizenships. Then Moldova and Montenegro quickly uh, closed or said they would close. Montenegro then came back. Cyprus then closed. So you can see over the course of the last four decades, there's been a lot of countries that have come and gone. Who are the most consistent players? St. Kitts and Nevis, Dominica. They've been around for decades. They still exist to this day. Grenada stopped. There was, there was some, there's a couple things you heard through the grapevine about Grenada back then. I think now it's a very well-run program. Um, and so you have some newer players to the game. But the point is, these options don't last forever. Turkey recently raised its price. They started a million. Then they realized that wasn't working, went to 250. Then it really, 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 really worked. Now they went to 400,000. And so if you missed out, you're going to have to invest more money. And it makes it harder to decide, should I donate $100,000 in the Caribbean or invest $400,000 in Turkey? 100 versus 250 was an easier decision. It's not an option anymore. Many of these programs have gone away. I'd love to be Peruvian, right? Um, I think that, you know, for certain people, some of these interesting, eclectic South Pacific passports could be interesting. Um, Belize would be a great passport to have. And obviously for some people, you want a place to go. You could live in Belize, you could live in Ireland. You're probably not gonna live in Tonga, but you could live in a number of these countries. You could do so in a tax-friendly way in many cases. And so these programs come and go, sometimes through pushing of governments. We've talked about that recently. The US wants to go into the Caribbean and push some of these countries to get out of the business. Will that make it harder to get these citizenships? Uh, it's possible. And it's possible that they start introducing more and more requirements. I'm not opposed. I've been through the due diligence process numerous times. I, fine. That's what you want to do. Let's have only good people get into the citizenship. That makes my citizenship more valuable, knowing that I'm not going to be lumped in with some bad actors. Uh, but will they make it to where you have to go and live in these countries? Will they, you know, you have to go in and spend some time or travel or, or wait longer or pay more money or make lower quality investments, right? I think that's certainly a, a possibility. And so if we look at over the last four decades, all the programs that have gone away and the low price points that you used to have, I think there's a possibility that you're gonna to have to pay a higher price point, not tomorrow, but uh, in the coming years. And I think more likely be subject to more restrictions in terms of making it more difficult to get. Western countries have a multi-decade history of not wanting you to have options. I think that's true now more than ever. And so whatever they were telling Peru and Belize and the Marshall Islands to get out of the business way back when, they're now trying it again. Except this time, more people realize they have options. More people are looking at this. This is now headline news. Billionaires and everyday millionaires are getting their backup passports. I see it all the time in magazines and newspapers. It is a hot topic. And so 12 people got Peruvian citizenship back then. How many would get it today? The optionality that you have today, in my opinion, is amazing. And it's worth having your backup passport now because it's never going to be $11,000 or $15,000 or $25,000 or $40,000 again. And there will come a time when $100,000 was a bargain. Take some money off the table, put it into some kind of passport strategy, whether it's by investment or some other way to make sure that you don't get stuck later.